Hey, beloved, this is Gary coming to you from the lamp. And again, we're coming to you with relevant tools, teachings, and resources, uh, and spiritual nuggets and food to appease your spiritual appetite. Hey, first of all, we want to say thank you for walking with us on this journey. We know it's been a long road. Uh, we've built some relationship. We've cried. We've laughed. We've thought. Uh, we've pondered. We've grown together as a community. And we want to say thank you. We appreciate your time and your energy even to look at our videos and to actually give us feedback. Beloved, we are now approaching again what I, what I believe to be one of the pillars of Christianity, and it is known as the doctrine of justification. How is a human in right standing with God, or how can somebody be completely acquitted of their, their sinful debt, um, the wrath of God that's due them? How can they be acquitted of that in one instantaneous moment, we're getting ready to jump in. Come on, let's go for it. As you know, beloved, we have four points, and our points are as follows. Justification defined, the issue, guilty or not guilty, the great exchange, and the last one is... The future is now. I would like to say a few words of encouragement as we go in here so that we can have a sort of a foundation to work with. Truth sets a person free. Not only does truth sets a person free, but our beloved Messiah said, knowledge of the truth sets a person free. Once truth is attained, it has the ability to lighten the load of the burdens in which we carry in this life that we were never designed to carry. Truth, beloved, is the line or demarcation in which lies and deception cannot cross over and enter. Beloved, lies and deception will try to creep in, and when they try to creep in, their ultimate objective is to make you a slave without your noticeability of it. Biblical justification is the truth and how God manifested his love towards those who were rebellious by providing a means and a way to cause an individual to be deemed righteous in his sight and in his presence. Now that we have that all through, let's dive in. Beloved, our opening scripture comes from Paul in his epistle, his letter to the church at Rome, and he tells them this, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And that's good news. I'm stoked. Beloved, that takes us into our first point, and our first point is justification defined. Now, beloved, I brought some friends along with me, and they're going to help us sort of define this phenomenal word so that we can sort of have a pretty cool foundation as we walk through this doctrine together. An unknown author gives us these words from Bible.org, and he or she makes this statement, beloved, Justification is the declared purpose of God to regard and treat the sinners who believe in Jesus Christ as if they had not sinned on the ground of the merits of the Savior. It is not mere pardon. Pardon is a free forgiveness of past, of past offenses. It has references to those sins as forgiven and absolutely blotted out. Our friend J. Rodman Williams, in his systematic theology in the area of justification, he makes this statement. The usual meaning of the term, especially found in the writings of Paul, is to pronounce or declare righteous. The striking feature about the word justification is its declaratory aspect. It does not mean to make righteous or just, as noted. To declare or pronounce righteous. Hence, one who is justified is one who is declared by God to be righteous. So hear me, beloved. 
The doctrine of justification did primarily deals with two aspects. The, pardon, the pardoning of sin, blotting out of sin, and also making you right and in right standing with the very creator God who is holy and righteous. This happens instantaneously once you believe in Messiah, your sins are blotted out, you have been acquitted of all charges, and beloved, you are made available to stand upright in Yahweh's presence. That's good news. Another aspect of this, beloved, is these are law terms. These are, these are sort of terms that deal with laws, okay? And so another aspect of justification here is that the law can't touch you. You have been acquitted from wrongdoings and therefore the law or the lawgiver has no means to judge you or pronounce judgment on you because again, you've been acquitted, therefore you're innocent, okay? That's a huge spectrum of it, which also ties us and leads us into our second point, which is this, the issue, guilty or not guilty. Beloved, we have to understand that in Adam all sinned because humanity was in Adam. So when Adam sinned, all humanity became guilty of that sin or missing the mark, which is rebellion against God. He sets up a system called the law in which it allows his presence, he himself, to be among his called out ones, his people Israel. We see this in Leviticus where it mentions this, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for life. What God is saying here is according to the law, typically in order for a person to be justified or freed or acquitted from any sin that they had just committed, they had to offer a type of blood sacrifice depending on the type of sin, was dependent upon the type of offering or blood sacrifice that one had to give. So the question presented here, how can a person be freed without they themselves offering a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice that is sufficient to do away with all their sin, all their wrongdoings, all their offenses, past, present, and futuristically? But not just the sin aspect, but what can a human offer God to be made in right standing with a holy and a righteous God? Again, Paul makes this statement in Romans. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, Christ's blood, he died for our sins and rose again to make us right with God, filling us with God's goodness. So now, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith in his promises, we can have real peace with him because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. And that comes from Romans chapter 4, 25 through chapter 5, verse 1. And that is out of my favorite translation, the Living Bible. I want to also say this, that God foretold about a promised, a promised one coming who will have the title, the Lord our righteousness futuristically through the prophets speaking about one who was to come who who not only will be righteous but will be for us our righteousness isn't that good news this leads us beloved into our third point which is known as the wonderful exchange or in theology it's known as the great exchange beloved there are two important points sub points within this third point of this doctrine that we need to focus on. The first point is our sin and guilt. Something has to be done about that. It, it, it doesn't just go away. Something has to be done with our sin and guilt. The next point, beloved, as a sub point is Christ's death. Why did he die? Okay. So now going back to our first point, sin and guilt, our sin and guilt, we carry this. It's we're sinners. We are sinners by nature, by birth, okay? So not only does our, our, our offenses have to be dealt with, but our very nature, something about our nature has to be, something has to be done with it. Our friend George Ladd mentions this. When Adam sinned, 
His guilt was imputed to us. God the Father viewed it as belonging to us, and therefore it did. Well, beloved, Paul's guilt from his sin was transferred onto us because all humanity was in Adam when he sinned or rebelled. Beloved, our apostle Paul makes this statement. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Paul further explains in verse 18, he makes this statement. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Well, Paul can make that statement because in understanding, all men were in Adam. He further goes on in Ephesians, beloved, and he makes this statement. That by very nature, our nature, we were objects of God's wrath because of our rebellion. Not only our sin, but our very nature, okay, was rebellious against God, which made us objects of wrath because understanding God again is a holy and a righteous God. God does not deal with man on a curve. He deals with man in black and white. Either you're guilty or you're free, either you're right or you're wrong. Our second point is significant, which deals with Christ's death. In dealing with this beloved, again, our friend George Ladd from his, his book, New Testament Theology, he makes this profound statement in dealing with this area. The death of Christ as the grounds for justification is set forth in the greatest details in Romans 3, chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. People are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God has put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. The shedding of Christ's blood, i.e. the sacrificial death, provides the means of propitiation on the grounds of which acquittal or justification can be bestowed upon humanity as a free gift. Beloved, this is good news. John, so justification for one to be justified from their wrong acts, have a way for that has now been made. Christ is both the person and the way in which a man or a woman or a child or person can be completely freed and acquitted from their wrongdoing and their very nature, which is rebellion against God. Beloved, this is known as the doctrine of non-imputation of sin, which means that because of this exchange, Christ took your filthiness, we got his righteousness, and because of this, we are now in right standing with Yahweh God. Beloved, I want to emphatically say this. There is no other means or way for anybody to be in right standing with God other than through Jesus Christ. You yourself cannot pay off your debt. You yourself cannot do anything right. It has to be a sacrifice one that is worthy, hear me, one that is worthy who can do this in your place because you alone don't have the ability or the inability or anything to offer to God that is worthwhile to make you right in his standing. This is the doctrine of justification, that God has justified you through Christ. He has justified you from the very thing that kept you away from him. And through Christ, he has brought you into himself and not only made you righteous but made you a child of righteousness i want to i want to make this statement before we go on beloved there is no other way in which a human can be right with god you have to accept jesus as your sacrifice as the one who stayed in your place in order to be in right standing with abba with yahweh you cannot do this on your own. You cannot, there's nothing you can do to make you right with a holy and righteous God because we by nature are not holy and righteous. We are sinful. We are dirty. We are unclean. We give into proclivities that are against his will, missing the mark, right? 
And so God has afforded a way for you to be right with him, to be perfectly right with him. People, that is good news. That is freedom. That is joy to know that you won't have to pay for something that you did. This takes us to our third point within this particular point in our justification, our sub point, and it is this, imputation of Christ's righteousness. Imputation of Christ's righteousness. What that's saying, beloved, is that our sin was imputed unto Christ. Our debt payment was imputed. The wrath of God that was for us, stored up for us, was imparted unto Christ. In the exchange, beloved, he took that of ours and he freely gave us his perfect holiness and righteousness. Something about this word imputation. The word imputation theologically means to attribute righteousness or guilt to a person or persons vicariously ascribed as derived from another and that is dictionary.com. We use dictionary.com to define stuff. <laughs> We've been imputed with his righteousness, which means naturally we receive the benefits of being what Christ was in God because as he became sin, we became his righteousness and therefore we reap the benefits of being righteous and holy in God's sight. We must keep in mind, beloved, that this righteousness is not ours. This righteousness has been given to us as a free gift, right? It didn't belong to us. We didn't earn it. You cannot earn it. You cannot pay to get this. It has to simply be received on the account of the great exchange. You can't earn your way, beloved. This simply how it must be. It must be imparted into your account through faith. Our last point is this. The future is now. Why do you say that point, Gary? Because we have to understand for all those justification is really something that was to happen in the future beloved the bible precisely talks predominantly about two ages the age in which we are now and the age which is to come beloved the word for age in the greek is this word aeon and we have to understand the significance of this because it's mentioned approximately 150 times in the new testament paul beloved he makes this statement in Ephesians that the work in Christ, which he raised from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age also, but in the one to come. The two aspects of this age, which are the age that is now and the age to come. The age now speaks of this age of death in which the Bible says that sin, that death entered through sin and therefore all men died, all men will die. The book of Hebrews says it's appointed unto men to die once, okay? And then the judgment seat, Paul says, for as in Adam all died. Our beloved brother Paul goes further in, in making this statement about this age. And he says this, you're not going to be able to escape this age by yourself, by yourself. He makes this statement again when he says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death or decay? Speaking of the age in which he is a part of, he further then goes on to say, thank God for Jesus, right? Thank God for Jesus. Now, beloved, the second age is this new creation, all things made right, all things made new. Not only all these things made right and made new, but there's no death. There is just complete life and hear me, enduring everlasting life. Okay? That's the new age. But hear me, the new age was far off. It wasn't anything close. Right? This is how the Old Testament, Old Testament authors depict this. You can find this predominantly in Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 66, where God talks about a new heaven and a new earth is going to be made. Okay, and he goes into great detail about how the ox and the lion will eat straw. He's speaking of something that is far in, in, in a far, far distance. The two ages cannot coexist. You're either in this age or you're in this age. 
And hear me, the, the issue here is we know that we are a part of the old age of death and destruction, but the question here is how do we get liberated so that we can enter into the new age of enduring life? How? The issue, beloved, with the second age is this. Our Messiah came and entered into this old age that through his death, he would produce in us that which was to come, the future age. Beloved, we gotta understand that justification is eschatological. What I mean by that, people, is justification really is future tense. It is not something that can happen now because of the law, right? You have to keep paying for your sins and offering sacrifice. But hear me, when Jesus came, he presented himself as a sacrifice, and with that, he inaugurated the new age in the old age. That's how come the Bible says we are new creature, we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Beloved, we manifest the new age because that's where our home is. John says we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Why? Because we are a part of a completely different age. Paul makes this statement in Romans. I say a lot of Romans, but listen to this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set me free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Paul also says in Romans, for those who are led by the spirit are sons and daughters of God. Okay? So we are a part of a new age in which God's spirit lives in us. We are manifesting that new age in an old age. We are manifesting and producing life in an age of death and destruction. Isn't that a, isn't that a marvelous thing that God has included us in? Paul also mentions this in Ephesians. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Above all else, I want you to get this. Justification was not something that was supposed to take place in an old age of destruction. Justification, complete, full justification was supposed to take place in the new age. So we understand that Christ came in and he, he gave us something. That's why he says, unless a seed dies and goes into the ground, it doesn't, it won't produce. But it produced his death in us, produced justification from all sin, guilt. Beloved, I'm also going to say that, that there are other particularities in which we are justified from that the Bible clearly expresses as the people and the community of God. Listen, beloved, I pray that this doctrine of justification helps you. I pray that it empowers you and gives you strength to endure this life with joy and peace by being in Jesus. Hey, if you like our videos, give us a thumb up, give us a thumb up, comment, agree, disagree, share with us your thoughts. If we miss something, hey, please share it with us. Hey, again, we have created a, 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 a whole stream of notes for each doctrine. And we want to give these to you all free of charge. We want to put this in your hand because there are things in the notes that we don't necessarily get to hit on. We want to say here at The Lab, we love you and we're praying for you. And you all be blessed. And until we meet again, we say shalom, beloved.